how's that turning into a media circus? Okay, well tell me, what's the context and if it's out of context, what is the context? You're not saying anything, Tony. Um, I've given you the response you deserve. Born in London on the 4th of November 1957, one man would irreparably destroy the Australian political landscape with anti-scientific, misogynistic, far-right rhetoric and propaganda. And now it looks like he's moved overseas to do it all again. So today, we say, Tony Abbott, this is your life. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 cringeworthy Tony Abbott moments. Now, last time I did a video like this, um, uh, one viewer took umbrage with some of the rude things that I said about Alan, and well, the gas man here is completely right, of course. I did directly attack the man, well, because it was funny, and I'm petty. But I also assume he missed all of the, you know, racist and misogynistic parts. You know, the ones that I listed, with references. Oh well, this one's for you, Gaz. I hope you're still watching, because now I'm going to talk about Tony here and why no government should ever hire him ever again. <laughs> old Tony boy is fairly roundly despised here in the, uh, the good old land of Oz. He has the record for the third lowest ever approval rating and never aroused more than 47% of population approval whilst he was in office, and his successor was voted into office after only two years of Tony time. But long before that, Tony was but a young right-wing student at the University of Sydney, organising rallies in support of the unconstitutional coup by the CIA and meeting with hard-right Catholic conservative columnists. He is also a Rhodes Scholar, proving that intelligence is not a substitute for being a good person. But back in Australia, Abzi worked as a journalist and then a political staffer for the Australian Liberal Party, you know, the Conservatives. When the Libs lost the 1993 election, after they tried to introduce regressive tax legislation, Tones moved into something far more influential, heading up the Australians for Constitutional Monarchy. Now, if you're an English viewer tuning in to see just who Boris Johnson has hired to put on the UK Board of Trade, this might not seem all that bad, you know, pip pip cheerio, God save the Queen and all that. But the fact that one woman and her family over 15,000 kilometres away is the ruler of a nation of people who, by and large, are not English and whose land was owned for 40,000 years by its traditional owners and custodians is disgusting to me. I have no interest in being the subject of anyone, let alone someone whose power is not derived through democratic interests. But Tony disagrees. He served as the first National Executive Director for Australians for Constitutional Monarchy, fighting for an unequal and bureaucratic nightmare of a system, one that directly allowed that CIA coup we talked about earlier. And from that role, he jumped to a safe liberal seat in Sydney's Northern Beaches, which he held until 2019, never dropping below 55% two-party preferred vote. The Australian system uses preferential voting because we are smart. Now let's talk about the really fun stuff, you know, Tony's time in office, because this is where we start to find some of the really egregious stuff. As Minister for Employment Services, Tony was instrumental in setting up the Job Network, a series of privatised businesses and charities, ostensibly with the role of finding people work, and the work for the dole system. Buckle up because this part's really bad. As a conservative, Tony is absolutely opposed to major government spending on social services. When he was opposition leader, he ran on a platform of cutting spending to lower debt. You know, the old classic. But as I discussed in the video here about neoliberal political theory, social services are incredibly popular. Government policies that allow people to live happy and healthy lives are generally beloved. Polling data shows this. Same polling data I used in the other video. And it's why people are swing voters on issues like healthcare. So if you're Tony and you've been given the job of cutting money from Australia's employment and welfare benefit schemes, you've got two options. One is demonise the recipients, turn the public against those receiving the payments. <laughs> this happens near constantly. You'll see it today in Australia and in the US where politicians are saying we need to stop paying people all of this money, they're being lazy and they don't want to work because they're getting paid more at home. For 68% of people receiving it right now, they are being paid more on unemployment 
than they made in their job. And I'll tell you, I've spoken to small business owners all over the state of Texas who are trying to reopen and they're calling their, their waiters and waitresses, yeah. they're calling their busboys, and they won't come back. And of course they won't come back as the federal government is paying in some instances twice as much money to stay home. You know, why don't the businesses just pay them a livable wage? But besides that, you can do the second option. You can make the process of receiving those payments as onerous and difficult as possible so people don't even want to try. With the institution of both the job network and work for the dole, this second option is what Tony went with. By privatising the job network, Tony incentivised the private employment providers to place unemployed people into any work or programme that they could so that they could get paid their bonuses. This involved throwing people into interviews and jobs that they were unprepared and unqualified for, sending massively overqualified people to menial jobs, and by pushing people into work for the dole. Now that's, that's really the worst. So we're gonna talk about it now. On the surface, the more conservatively minded people here might hear the name work for the doll. Oh, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> or at least, you know, that's oh, it's fine, you know. People should work for the money that they receive. But the problem is that line of thinking. Firstly, when you're unemployed and looking for work, the stipulation you need to be looking for work is required to receive payments. You're not just sitting on your ass waiting for something to drop into your lap. Insert always sunny jobbies bit. Get a job. Oh, get a job? Yeah. Just get a job? Why don't I strap on my job helmet and squeeze down into a job cannon and fire off into job land where jobs grow on jobbies? It is an active search and one that takes time. Time that work for the doll steals from you. The second issue is that when Abbott introduced the scheme, it was made compulsory. You had to turn up to a job site or charity shop and work long hours for below minimum wage. Well, the only extra payment provided to you was introduced in 2002 with a training credit of $800 to help upskill. So you weren't even getting any extra money for working. The other thing that occurred in 2002 was work for the doll changed from benefiting governments and community organizations to also working for private interests. Suddenly, private businesses could hire workers and not pay them. And this received no mainstream pushback. The system continued through two separate Labour governments. They do not get off scot-free here. They could have easily dismantled the system and built something better, but they decided not to. And when Tony came back into power as PM, he oversaw a major overhaul of the system. More age groups were compelled to join. It was entirely run by private companies. And participants were required to perform community service as well to receive their payments. An onerous requirement designed to demonise the recipients in the eyes of the public. They're stealing your money and need to work for it. The worst day in the history of work for the doll was the day an 18 year old named Josh Park Fing died from head injuries sustained while working for the company Neato. His family didn't receive answers until June of this year when an internal Queensland government probe found that Neato had ignored several on-site safety incidents and had no certified supervisor on site the day Josh died. The Australian Unemployed Workers Union launched a campaign for answers in response to Josh's death, and as of September 2020, the official federal report has not been released. All of this hardly covers the uh, full abuses of the job network, now the job active system. The AUWU compiles complaints against the unemployed service providers and posts member stories on their website, and they are a veritable treasure trove of absolute horror. Multiple stories about Centrelink and JSPs ignoring medical certificates and cutting people off payments, signing people up to courses irrelevant to their fields of study in order to get paid bonuses, and how on work for the dole sites, Welfare recipients were verbally abused by supervisors, not trained properly, not given breaks, told not to worry about safety issues, and how one man was exposed to asbestos on his site. And it was covered up. And all of this stems from Tony's time in office. He and his conservative ilk have irreparably ruined the lives of those less fortunate. And I haven't even gotten to the climate denial yet. <laughs> but before we talk about that, we're gonna talk about Tony and the ladies. Specifically, the multiple times he's been openly misogynistic towards colleagues and the women of Australia in general. Firstly, as health minister, the staunchly Catholic abbot opposed the use of the drug mifepristone used to bring about to the termination of a pregnancy. Unsurprisingly, the man is anti-choice, but he's also very openly anti-choice, saying, Mr. Speaker, we have a bizarre double standard. The bizarre double standard in this country where someone who kills a pregnant woman's baby is guilty of murder, 
but a woman who aborts an unborn baby is simply exercising choice. Good to know that any woman who accidentally causes her own miscarriage is guilty of manslaughter, you obnoxious prude. <laughs> Early in his tenure as opposition leader, he felt it necessary to explain electricity price increases in a way that the women of Australia could understand. What the housewives of Australia need to understand is, as they do the ironing, is that if you get it done commercially, it's going to go up in price, and their own power bills when they switch the iron on are going to go up. Yeah, that's a real quote from the future Prime Minister of Australia. In 2012, he describes having told his daughters that a woman's virginity is the greatest gift you can give someone. And this happened in a radio interview in response to a comment by a chronically ill pensioner. Tony Abbott has been filmed winking during a radio show. I'm a 67 year old <clears throat> pensioner, three chronic incurable medical conditions, mm -hmm. two life threatening, and I work on an adult sex line to make ends meet. But arguably the most famous thing Tony Abbott is known for in regards to sexism and misogyny is the Gillard speech. Toto had spent months in his rabid attacks on Prime Minister Gillard and was open in his courting of those who openly despised her not only for her politics but for her gender. This is one of the most famous photos of the future PM from this period and you really can't equivocate on that. Now no matter what you think of Jules's politics, this speech made to Parliament is one of the defining aspects of both her Prime Ministership and Australian politics of the 21st century. In a normal country, it it should have ended Tony's career to be so openly rebuked and his faults listed in the open forum the leader of as the opposition. And, and in so doing, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I will not. And the Government will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. Not now, not ever. The Leader of the Opposition says that people who hold sexist views and who are misogynists are not appropriate for high office. Well, I hope the Leader of the Opposition has got a piece of paper and he is writing out his resignation. Because if he wants to know what misogyny looks like in modern Australia, he doesn't need a motion in the House of Representatives. He needs a mirror. But Australia isn't a normal country, it's a nation with deep racial and sexual divides, and two years later, this man would be the Prime Minister. <sighs> Right, what's next? I've got it, the casual homophobia. <laughs> in an interview with 60 Minutes, Tony said he was threatened by homosexuality. Homosexuality, mm -hmm. how do you feel about that? Oh, I probably feel a bit threatened. <laughs> and when challenged, doubled down with, there's no doubt that homosexuality challenges, if you like, orthodox notions of the right order of things. <laughs> in 2017, two years after being thrown to the back benches by his own party, Tony became the de facto parliamentary leader of the no vote on marriage equality, where he said, if you're worried about religious freedom and freedom of speech, vote no. And if you don't like political correctness, vote no, because voting no will help to stop political correctness in its tracks. Just some slight homophobia there, claiming that marriage equality is part of, you know, the greater culture war, just among normal Aussie things. Tony's best moments when it comes to LGBT rights are when members of his own family have come out to rebuke him publicly, with both his daughter Frances stating she doesn't agree with her father, saying that marriage is the basis of family, even though for years Tony believed that he had a child at 22 outside of wedlock, and his sister, Sydney councillor and lesbian Christine Forster, accusing her brother of misrepresenting New Zealand's falling marriage rates, a trend that had been observed since 1999, 14 years before the introduction of marriage equality. End quote. There was an upturn in 2013, she explained, only since then had the long-term downward trend, dominated by heterosexuals, resumed. Even though the country voted 68 to 38 percent in favour of marriage equality on the plebiscite in 2017, and Tony's electorate polling the fourth highest yes vote in the nation at 75 percent, he chose to leave Parliament and refuse to vote. Okay, let's get to the big ticket issue, and the one that gave us Prime Minister Tony. Abbott. Open and brazen, anti-scientific, 
climate change denialism. For a nation beset by sea and crowned by one of the largest series of deserts in the world, we have a shit ton of people who do not see the link between climate change and increased drought, bushfire prevalence, dangerous flooding, and rising sea levels. Tony Abbott, for many years, was chief of this brigade. In 2009, the incumbent Labour government attempted to pass an emissions trading scheme in an attempt to combat climate change. This bill, in hindsight, wasn't the best. It was quite weak, market-led, and was opposed by the Australian Greens on this ground, something I would say is quite noble, as they later supported much stronger and more successful efforts. But the Liberal National Coalition, led by Malcolm Turnbull, initially supported the bill and attempted to modify it to their interests. Tony Abbott resigned his position in the Shadow Cabinet in response and immediately challenged for the leadership, won, and blocked the bill from passing. Then in 2010, PM Gillard announced, in conjunction with the Australian Greens and the Crossbench, a carbon tax. This price on pollution would cause a massive drop in emissions. The graph is on screen right now, it's true. It's a big drop. But Tony was furious. So on the first day of his prime ministership, he introduced legislation to repeal said carbon tax. In 2017, he spoke to the Global Warming Policy Fund, a climate denial group based in London, and said that climate change was probably doing good, at least. More good than harm. And then he argued that higher concentrations of carbon dioxide act as plant food and are actually greening the planet and helping to lift agricultural yields. Yes. All of those agricultural yields that will soon be underwater. How exciting. And finally, in 2019, he claimed that the world was in the grips of a climate cult. And this is the man that Boris Johnson wants help writing trade policy. Tony Abbott is, and I hesitate to say even this, a relic of a bygone era. His far-right social policies delayed social change in Australia or forced them to be played out and mocked on the national stage. His anti-scientific beliefs made him dangerous as health minister and downright apocalyptic as prime minister. His views on women and their role in society seem rooted in some sense of 50s nostalgia, hearkening back to a time when women were seen and not heard, and elected three years before Trump, Tony's victories in the political realm emboldened the conservative rings of the Liberal National Parties, and Australia has been beholden to their whims ever since. I didn't even talk about how his government destroyed the National Broadband Network, one of the most progressive, forward-thinking pieces of policy of the 21st century, which was something he called a luxury in 2013, but is quite clearly a necessity in 2020, nor his calls for special treatment for white South African farmers, which is a white supremacist conspiracy theory, nor even his call to return to at-fault divorce, meaning one partner has to prove adultery, abuse, or other misconduct in an attempt to strengthen the family unit. There was also the highly prejudicial boat turnback policy, which was only designed as a dog whistle towards the far-right racist members of the Australian community who didn't want more brown people on their streets. You know, the one that's now supported by both major parties. The man is a disgrace to modern Australian politics, to the purported progressive values of most socially liberal countries in the world, and his supporters will often point to his charity work and his volunteering with the CFS to show that he is at heart a good person, but if he wants my respect, he needs to never open his mouth about public policy again and should stick to fighting fires, because of him there will be many more. Don't let this man ruin your democracy, Great Britain. Like, I know you guys elected your very own Tony Abbott, but like, who needs two of them? Right, Tony. That was your life. You're awful. Please stop, you absolute laughing buffoon. Hope you liked it, Gaz. But if anyone is the suppository of wisdom, surely it's Tony Abbott, a man who always knows exactly what to say or not to say and who's won exactly as much respect from his constituents as he deserves. Good morning, sir. How are you? Dig it.